Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at the structure of the gills, buckle pumping, counter current flow, and then we'll finish with a summary. So first of all, before we can understand how fish exchange gases with their environment, we need to understand the structure of the organ which does this. And in fish that have skeletons or bones, they use organs called gills. Fish need to perform gas exchange just like any other animals, except they have to do this whilst they live underwater. So obviously a lot of fish spend most of their time submerged deep in the water. For humans, we just exchange gases with the environment and the air that has these gases. However, for fish, they cannot access this air very well because they're underwater. Therefore, they have to absorb gases that have been absorbed in the water or dissolved in the water. And they have different organs that do this. Fish are quite active animals. They're always moving and they can grow quite large in size as well. So they've evolved gills to exchange gases efficiently. So the way that they move through the water is that water enters the mouth as they swim and then it passes out of their body through these gill structures as they move. And then these that you can see on the side here are what we call the gills. And these are only found on bony fish. So what are the structures of the gills? Well, we need to go sort of from an outside in perspective here. So what the gills are is it's a set or a series of bony gill arches, which are these larger structures here. And each gill arch has two stacks of gill filaments. So to illustrate that in a diagram, what we have is we have one arch, which is this structure here. So this is one gill arch. And this gill arch has two sets. So this is set one and set two of the filaments. So these are the gill filaments. And then we've got another arch here, which has its own two sets of filaments and so on and so forth. So these are what the gills look like. And there are some vascular vessels running through the gill arches through their center. So if we zoom into the gill filaments, they have extra features on them as well. So the gill filaments have protruding rows of very thin lamellae. So a lamellae is something that's used in biology to describe something that's quite thin and flat, or that tends to protrude out somewhere. So remember, this is zooming back in. So we've got the gill arch, which is this structure, and then these are the filaments. And then what you can see are these disc shapes, which are sticking out of the filaments and protruding up and down. So these are the lamellae and one single would be a lamella. So zooming in again, each lamella consists of a network of capillaries covered by a single layer of epithelial cells. So what we've done now is we've got this material which is the filament and we've just zoomed into one part of the filament. And what we've got is we've got deoxygenated blood running towards capillaries and as it reaches this point the capillaries are branching and forming a network over this area here and this is the lamella. So this is the protruding membrane sticking up from the filament. This would be going underneath and above. The capillaries then connect back up and then they take oxygenated blood to wherever it needs to go. Remember capillaries are the site at which gas exchange occurs. So this is the capillary network. And it's only covered by, as it said, a single layer of epithelial cells, which means it's a very thin diffusion pathway. So the gill structures are quite delicate because they're made up of lots of tiny structures that we've just been through. So because they're delicate, they're protected by a layer of bone or a bony plate. And this bony plate is called the operculum. So this is just a diagram looking through the top of a fish. If you imagine the fish's eyes would be either side and we've kind of cut through the fish longitudinally. We've got the mouth here and then what we've got is the skeleton of the mouth and its mouth cavity. And these are the gills. So there's obviously gills on the right and the left, just as there are lungs on our right and left as well. This plate of bone here is called the operculum because you can see that it's protecting the gills from a lot of the outside environment. There's a little tiny part of the operculum here which can open and close. So what we've got on this side is we've got the gills are closed, but the mouth is open. So this is a closed state. And on this side, we've got exactly the same structures, but the mouth is now closed and the operculum covering part has become open. So water can flow through that. That's the general structure of the gills that you need to be aware of. Buckle pumping is a mechanism that fish use in order to make water flow through the gills and deliver gases to those capillaries. So there's a few analogies with the human lungs here and the way that they refresh the air into the alveoli. The most important thing is that there's ventilation in the lungs so that the air is refreshed every time we breathe. And this is done in the process of inspiration and expiration. So the mechanics are quite complicated and we won't go into them here. But the idea of this is that the lungs sort of inflate and deflate in order to bring fresh oxygenated blood from the atmosphere into our lungs. And then once we've brought CO2 blood through, we breathe out to let the CO2 escape into the atmosphere. If the lungs didn't refresh or ventilate the air, the air would become very stagnant 
all of the O2 would be used up and the CO2 would build up and it would just be a big problem. So in the same way, fish need a way of refreshing the water over the gills so that they keep replenishing the oxygen towards the capillaries and removing the waste gases. So the way they do this is through the buckle pump mechanism. So they need to ventilate their gills, but in this case it's obviously with water, and the gases they're trying to take are dissolved in that water, whereas for us they're just in the air. The purpose of this is maintaining a strong diffusion gradient for efficient gas exchange. So the way that they do this is that they use the coordinated opening of the opercular vents and the closing of their buccal cavity. So just going back to some of the structures, the mouth is here at the front of the fish and it opens and closes in time with the operculum that covers the fish gills. So remember this is the operculum and this part of the operculum is the vent which can open and close letting water out of the gills. So it's this coordinated opening of the mouth and the operculum which allows the buccal pump to ventilate water through. The buccal cavity is basically something that refers to the mouth, so it's the fish's mouth. Buccal always refers to the cheeks or the part of the oral cavity. So the buccal cavity for the mouth would consist of its mouth and the area in which water is breathed in. So this would be the buccal cavity. So first of all what happens is the fish open their buccal cavity and then they close the opercular vents while they do this. What this does is it draws fresh water into the buccal cavity which then gets pumped over the gills. So if you imagine the mouth is now open and the water can be brought in to the fish's buccal cavity. At this point the vents are obviously closed so that water doesn't escape and it makes them flow over the gills. What then happens is the mouth becomes closed and then the opercular vents become open. And what this does is it provides the next step of the pathway for the water that's in the mouth to now flow over the gills and escape out of this vent. So in a way what it's doing is it's allowing this one-way traffic of water to enter the mouth first of all and then to go through the gills and out that way. If this wasn't coordinated, if the mouth was open at the same time as the vents were open, the water could go in either direction and therefore there wouldn't be much of a flow. The direction of the flow is very important. There are some fish which don't use this exact same mechanism. For example, sharks, they don't have this buckle pump. So in order to keep the water flowing from their mouth through their gills, they have to keep swimming forward constantly and all the time to keep a fresh supply of water flowing over their gills. You can imagine that this will just drive water in through the mouth and out of the gills all the time. If they stop swimming, water would be able to get in backwards and this water might not be so fresh because they've just breathed through it. An important mechanism that fish use is called the countercurrent flow mechanism, so we'll be going through this now. The gill filaments and the lamellae are oriented in such a way that it ensures water passes over them countercurrent to the flow of the blood. So countercurrent means that it runs in the opposite direction to the blood, even though it's parallel. So remember we've got blood flowing within capillaries over those lamellae, and the water needs to flow in the opposite direction to it. So countercurrent flow is defined as a term that describes two liquids that are in close proximity to each other, flowing in opposite directions. So one way to illustrate this might be that we have a vessel here carrying water, travelling in this direction, whereas directly below, or directly in close proximity, we have another vessel which might be carrying blood travelling in the opposite direction. They're close to each other and they're parallel, but because they're doing this in opposite directions, we name them countercurrent. So the countercurrent flow is a mechanism that isn't just random, it's designed like this to make sure that the gas exchange has a maximum efficiency, and the reason why will become clear soon. So just to recap, remember this is the filament of one of the gill arches, and we've zoomed in to one of these lamellae. And then what we have is we have a capillary network over this membrane surrounded only by one sheet of cells. So what happens is the water is going to be flowing in one particular direction, call it that direction, so behind the membrane, while the blood is flowing in the direction of the opposite direction. So this is where we have them flowing in opposite currents and this would be a countercurrent flow. So basically what happens is the water flows past the capillaries and it loses the oxygen to the blood down the diffusion gradient. The blood that's been coming back is now low in oxygen because it's come back from the fish's body and it's low in oxygen because it's been metabolizing, but it's high in carbon dioxide. The water is fresh and it should be full of oxygen, hopefully. So let's draw a diagram of what's happening here. We're going to illustrate the water as being in a sort of current of water like this. And we're going to have the water flowing in this direction. 
Well, we then have, if you imagine the capillaries of that lamellae from the gills, having blood flow through this direction. So this is coming from the fish's body, and so it's got low oxygen levels. Whereas the water here is coming with fresh water, and it's going to have high levels of oxygen as it comes in. So what's going to happen is the oxygen that's in the water is simply going to diffuse into the blood that the fish has on its gills, and then this will go to the body to replenish the cells of oxygen. So it's quite a similar mechanism that you'd see in the lungs. But the reason this countercurrent should become clear when we draw diagrams in the next few steps. So the blood that has very little oxygen flows past the part of the water with only some oxygen left. So again, we've got our water flowing in this direction here, and then we've got our close proximity blood capillary flowing in this direction here. So this part has just come from the body, as we just said, and it's got very low oxygen. The fresh water at this point has some oxygen, at least got more than the blood. So there's going to be diffusion of oxygen from the water into the blood. What then happens is, towards the other end of the diagram, so again, we've got water running in one direction and blood going in the other direction, so blood will be going this way. What happens now is that some of this blood has received oxygen from this part of the water, so it has some oxygen and it's partially saturated, but this part of the water has just come in, so this is the freshest part, and therefore this has even more oxygen than this part over here. So there's still a higher amount of oxygen in this part of the water than there is in this blood. Therefore, we're still going to get diffusion of oxygen into the blood, even though the blood's already received some from this part down here. So there's two steps to this. There's receiving blood from partially oxygenated water in very low oxygenated blood, and then there's receiving more oxygen, even though the blood's partially saturated with oxygen, because this is the freshest part of the water. If we didn't have this countercurrent mechanism, then we would only get diffusion in part of the vessels and not all of it. So if you can imagine we had water running in this direction, but then we had a blood vessel in close proximity running in the same direction, what we would have is we would have blood that's coming in with low oxygen, and being the freshest part of the water here, the O2 would be very high, and therefore we would obviously get lots of diffusion of oxygen as well as normal. But once we reach this part of the system, still running in the same direction, the water is now going to have equilibrated out its oxygen with the blood, and therefore it won't have any more oxygen than the blood to be able to deliver. So there'd be no diffusion happening in the second half of this pathway. So the really important point is that it's a countercurrent flow, so that all points along the vessels, diffusion of oxygen can happen, even if the blood has already received some earlier on. So that maximizes gas exchange, and therefore the amount of energy that the fish can have overall. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.